Hello and welcome back to the Roker Report podcast. It's Jimmy Lawson here and I'm delighted to say I've been joined by commentator Andy Moon. Andy, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. Yeah, can't complain at all. Looking forward to, uh, well, looking forward to the match on Saturday, if less so the, the drive up to Sunderland. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what sort of time do you have to set off to get set up? I'm thinking I'll probably set off about seven o'clock Saturday morning. And then uh, I'll probably end up staying up somewhere Saturday night and drive back Sunday. But uh, yeah, this is our longest one of the season. So uh, nice, nice to get it done. I think I've only ever once done the Sunderland game and then gone back down south the night of. And it is just, it's a killer. I mean, even, even the weekend up there, you find your whole weekend's gone. And before you know it, it's Monday again. But it is an absolute killer. Well, Sunderland have got to come to Pompey on a Tuesday night due to the joys of the fixture list. So it's not, mm. not particularly kind. At the time, it looked like you think there might be fans back in then after Christmas, but who knows now? Yes, it's, it's all absolutely up in the air. I think the main thing I'm sort of wondering from Portsmouth is what's, what's sort of the mood around the club at the moment, given that it's been another slow start for the season? It's pretty negative, really. The, the supporter base is pretty unhappy they are fed up with Kenny Jacket for, for a number of reasons and the mood is different going into the Sunderland game than it was at the weekend the loss to Doncaster on Saturday was really poor going forward Portsmouth just looked a team that were, were pretty clueless now it's changed a bit because Tuesday night Portsmouth a good win at Gillingham fully deserved and they actually look like a team going forward which hasn't necessarily been the case in the past few weeks, bar the Burton game when they played very well away and won, they've, they've looked toothless up front and then they lost Ellis Harrison at the weekend. So they're definitely concerned. But John Marquis got, got a much needed goal on Tuesday and they looked a better team going forward. But still, I think there is this frustration that, that under Kenny Jacket, Portsmouth have been the, the, the nearly club. They've got to the playoffs twice. They've not even got to the, the playoff final. And ultimately, there's been nothing so far this season to suggest that Portsmouth can get into the top two. Yes, you look at them and think, can they be a playoff team? Without doubt, they'll need to improve a bit, but that they're capable, they've got good players. But are they a team that look like they're going to finish in the top two? Certainly not on what we've seen so far. How much of the blame sort of for Portsmouth's struggles and for the creaky attack has been aimed at Jacket? How, how much of the flack has he taken? On social media, virtually mm. all of it. Kenny Jacket's philosophy is get your team set up defensively. That's your priority. He always talks about zeros and ones. You've got to concede zeros and ones in games if you're going to win promotion. And it's served him pretty well through his career. But at times, it sometimes feels like the attack is a bit of an afterthought. And there have been mixed responses. Even when Portsmouth, a couple of years ago, were climbing up to the top of the division, it's still very much a team that would be set up to be rock solid at the back and then just do enough going forward to get a goal from somewhere to win games. And I think the frustration with the fan base is not just on results. It's also the fact that at times the football is not necessarily that entertaining to watch. So he obviously stayed after the, the, the playoff defeat against Oxford. Was there ever any talk that, that he might go then? I think there's quite a lot of fans mm. that would like him to go, but he, he definitely had the, the full backing of Michael Eisner, the owner, and his family out in America. So it, it was never even really on the cards. It, it wasn't one of those where, as a journalist, you're making phone calls saying mm. this is gonna happen, what they're going to do. It was pretty clear from very soon after the Oxford game that he had a year left in his contract and he would certainly be given the next season. And this is the strange dilemma of Jacket. You look at his spell in three years and on paper... It's certainly not terrible. He's not achieved the ultimate goal of getting Portsmouth back to the championship, but there's been two playoff campaigns and a couple of years ago when, when Pompey lost to Sunderland in the playoffs, that season they were only a couple of points short of automatic promotion and they were really close to going up automatically that year. I don't think you can make the case last year. Obviously, it was all a bit strange with the season being cut short, but I personally believe if the season had finished, they would have still been about where they were, fourth or fifth in the playoffs. And the frustration with both the Sunderland campaign in the playoffs the year before and Oxford is they were just so insipid in the playoffs. They were so disappointing in what should have been the two biggest games. And particularly, with all due respect, which is something you normally say before you're about to offend someone, uh, offend someone against Oxford, you had the chance of Wickham at Wembley to get the place mm. in the championship. Now, Wickham obviously won and they were a decent team last year, but you, you think you don't get too many more better openings than that to get promoted. 
Yeah, those those two Oxford games were so bizarre. And I don't know if they were equally bizarre because you go four or five months out watching a League One game and you kind of forget what League One football looks like. But they, they were weird. Like, it, there was a lot of nerves. Neither team really played well. And it was it was just all really, really odd. Sort of, you talked about the Eisner's back in jacket. Is it, have they just, have they essentially come out and sort of relayed what you said about his track record, about him being as proven as you can be in League One? That's near enough. Now, they've not actually done an interview for, for around mm. two and a half years, which obviously, as a journalist covering court, because I'd like the chairman to speak more often. But on the flip side, they feel they want the chief executive, Mark Catlin, to do the speaking. And Mark is very open and accessible to journalists to speak to. So you, you accept that. And they sometimes put things out on Twitter. Michael and his son, Eric, who's particularly involved, and they normally just get a barrage of tweets back telling them jacket out, even if they put something Portsmouth related or, or, or not. But yeah, they, they've near enough said that they feel that they've seen enough positives from, from Jacket to give him this season. But it is interesting because he is in the last year of his contract. It's one thing for players going into the last year of his contract, but it's rare for managers to get that situation. And you're definitely in that no man's land right now of you're not going to offer him a new contract based on where they were. I'm sure if he got Portsmouth up, he would get a new deal. But you, you're not going to that they don't want to get rid of him, but you're not going to give him a new contract. So you're in this this interesting dilemma going into the final year of his contract. It's it's the worst thing in football. And even though I think things are going well at Sunderland, we still suffer massively from this. The If it goes wrong, oh, well, I'm not here. It's someone else's problem to clear up that I'm not going to be here in 12 months if it goes wrong. It's the sort of mentality that leads to us signing a 35-year-old Danny Graham and and all sorts of bad decisions happen out of the well, I've got nothing to lose, let's take a punt attitude. One thing that I think must be really interesting, it's something we talked a bit about after we drew with Bristol Rovers. What's it like covering a team that's under pressure when the fans aren't there? Interesting, I would say. Interesting. For a start, I feel there have been games at Fratton Park this season, last Saturday against Doncaster, the nil-nil with Shrewsbury. You think if supporters had been in the ground and the game had played out as they had, it would have got toxic. It would have got really nasty and the frustration would have been clear for all to see. Now, the counter argument is that if fans were allowed in the ground, I think there would be a slightly different feel and a a different approach to the game. From a journalist point of view, it's our job to ask the tough questions. Now, there's always people on, on Twitter that will tell you that you don't do that. But sometimes I think people, you know, want you to go and shout in Kenny mm. Jacket's face and tell him to clear off, mm. which is certainly not my job. And <laughs> Kenny Jacket will always answer anything you, you throw at him. He won't necessarily answer it convincingly or, or, or directly, but he'll never, you can, he's one of those managers, unlike the previous manager, Paul Cook, who could blow a gasket if he didn't <laughs> like the question. Kenny Jacket will virtually answer anything thrown at you. But it's, it's strange to try and convey across that, the feeling inside the ground when it's empty, when you know there's a there's an ang- angry population of fans not in the ground who would be who who would be expressing their frustrations. You know there would be boos coming through and such like. One thing I'd say Saturday and the loss to, to Doncaster, the players looked pretty shell shocked when they came mm. out, but they, no one was expecting a a performance like that. So I guess it's about trying to convey what you're seeing, things like that that people can't see themselves. Yeah, it's it's, it's so interesting because. We're sort of very similar and there's obviously sort of been a real sort of connection and link between the two clubs in the last two years. And I remember thinking, surely without the fans, the players are going to be immune to it to a certain degree. They're in a bit of a bubble. They don't have to deal with it. But but obviously it must seep through a bit. I wanted to sort of switch gears. Who's who's the saviour? Who's the person sort of people are in your mentions telling you this guy would turn around Portsmouth Football Club? In terms of managerial? Yeah. Well, I think this is the the strange thing. I think a lot of people would like Paul Cook to return. Now, that's interesting because Paul Cook's reign when he was in charge in League Two, actually, there was a lot of frustration at times. He played very much possession-based football, but at times it felt, well, certainly supporters felt it was passing for passing sake. And there could be games at Fratton Park where a nil-nil or Portsmouth would win one-nil where they'd have all the possession and fans would be frustrated. They want to see two up front. They wanted to see them going forward. Now, in hindsight, obviously, having won the league, a lot of people would say, bring back Paul Cook. He's, he's the man. Eddie Howe, of course, along the South Coast, mm. is the name thrown around. 
realistically, I think in the current financial climate, I don't think Portsmouth would be able to afford managers like that who have been used to living on championship and, and Premier League salaries. Those are often the names flying around. But in some ways, as soon, Lee Johnson's name gets thrown around. It, 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 names get thrown around left, right and centre. Other than Paul Cook, it doesn't feel like there's one name that the, the whole fan base throw out there. I also think we, we touched upon the backing of, of Jacket. There is also the element of, again, sacking someone and his coaching staff in the current climate would be expensive when Portsmouth are losing 750000 a month. Now, if Portsmouth were the bottom of the league and had lost every game, would they sack the manager? Yes, they would. But there is, I do think that is a factor that comes into play. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting. The other thing I wanted to touch on last season, there were a few sort of EFL accounts, a few people that sort of number crunched that kind of gave the impression that it was just bad luck, the odd bit of game management here and there, a bad slow start that, that led to sort of Portsmouth not achieving what they should achieve, that Portsmouth potentially were a better team than Rotherham and re really right up there with Peterborough as a team that, if the season had finished out, could have gone up. I'm getting the impression you, you don't really sort of subscribe to that theory. Having watched nearly every game is difficult to, and you, you touch upon Peterborough. Portsmouth, the Saturday before lockdown came in or, or the Saturday, the last Saturday game before game stopped was a trip to Peterborough. Now, Portsmouth were a centre-back down and Jack Watmore had to come in, so they had to reshuffle at the back. Watmore's a, a really good player, but he hadn't played for months, so he was uh, not at his best in that game. But Peterborough absolutely took Portsmouth apart. Ivan Tony looked one of the best players I'd ever seen play in League One. I was surprised in some ways. Without COVID, I dread to think how much money mm. Peter would have been able to bring in for him. But you look at that and you think Peterborough missed out on the playoffs. They absolutely took Portsmouth apart. And there was a, a feeling coming away from London Road that day. It wasn't just Portsmouth had been badly beaten. It was their away form, particularly against the top sides, was poor. And you thought, yes, they had enough home games left. They were probably going to be a playoff side. But how were Portsmouth going to go to one of these big sides in the division and get a result away from home, given how they, they had been? And... The crazy thing is Portsmouth then drew with Fleetwood on the Tuesday night. Had either team won that game, mm. Peterborough in the, in the playoffs. And believe me, everyone from the Portsmouth end who had seen Peterborough that Saturday was relieved they weren't in the mm. playoffs. I think the finishing position last year was about where it was. They were, slow to, they were slow to start and then they did get their momentum. But you actually looked at the run-in they had. They still had to go to Rotherham. They still had to go to quite a few of the top sides. I still think a top two place would have been, would have been out of reach for them. Yeah, I want to switch gears a bit. You mentioned Ivan Tony there, the Portsmouth player that I was like, this guy's this guy's gone, this guy's too good, what's he doing in League One, was Ronan Curtis, and yet, lo and behold, he's still there this season. Was there much speculation that he might leave? There's always a little bit of speculation. He, he still speaks to journalists back in Derry, so speaks to the paper there, so sometimes you get his views, his views out there, and many of you may know his mum's quite vocal uh, on Twitter, as well. I, it's interesting because when a player does well in League One, you think there's going to be championship interests. Now, there's been a couple of championship scouts that I've heard verdicts from through other people. And there's always this view with Ronan Curtis. He's, could he make it in the championship? There's always a yes, but. And then there's always concerns about certain areas of his game to, to look at it. You look at Ronan Curtis's numbers and his hundred odd appearances the goals and assists, over 50 combined. It's, the numbers are fantastic. Then if you want to be critical of him, you'd say, well, he's, he's really a left winger who likes to come in and shoot on his right foot. And if you can stop that happening, you can close down the most effective part of his game. Even that's a, a bit simplistic. He, he's better than that. But right now, his form just isn't quite there. And he's not started, didn't start against Gillingham. Whether he'll start against Sunderland is, is unclear at the moment. I'm a little bit surprised, maybe in a different financial climate, would someone in the championship have, have, have taken a gamble on him? Maybe. There was links that, that Brentford were looking at him. And when I heard Brentford were looking at him, I thought, he's, he doesn't strike me as a player that is going to go and get a team from the championship to the Premier League. But am I surprised that maybe a lower down championship side haven't come in? Yes, pro probably am a little bit. But he is a player who sometimes blows hot and cold. He started mm. last season really slowly. He started this season slowly, but last season he, he found a way to pick up and you'd expect him to do so. 
in his first season when he was brilliant at the start, it probably helped him that he'd come off an Irish season where he basically started his pre-season in what, January, whenever they do there. He played for a few months for Derry in, in the summer season, come over to Portsmouth, gone straight into pre-season, straight into the start of a, a busy campaign. He was fitter and more ready than just about anyone else in, in the division at that point. That certainly helped him. But he's made an impact. There haven't been firm bids or, or someone that the club said to me, in some ways they're surprised that we all know bids. Bids normally come in when you know they're going to be accepted or not. But there haven't been... They, they compared it to when Jed Wallace left Portsmouth from League Two to go up to the Championship, that there was calls regularly about Championship clubs, not necessarily inquiring about him, but wanting to know more about him. They, they say that hasn't necessarily been there for Curtis. And his slow start, is that just who he is? Just that he can be inconsistent, no real, too much to read into that? Yeah, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly exactly why the, the, the start has been slow. His, his, his goal numbers are still reasonably good over the time, even when his form's been up and down, but he hasn't made the impact. And the challenge Portsmouth have got is they brought Michael Jacobs in, who showed against Gillian what a class player he is. And he actually quite often likes to drift out to the left. So there's now a bit of a dilemma. Do you play Jacobs on the left of the three and then try Curtis on the right? And they've done that, but he's not of effective. So... There's still a bit of reshuffling going on up front and exactly how Ports are going to play to fit all the best players in hasn't quite been identified as yet. OK, yeah, and that's interesting. By my count, you've got three players who started the last game that have left. Hawkins also left. So I've got Steve Seddon, Cameron McGeehan and Christian Burgess, a midfielder, a centre-back and a left-back all gone. Have those guys been replaced? Well, not necessarily so Seddon came in on loan and made a really good impact at, at left back really started well Portsmouth would have liked to have brought him back in this summer Birmingham basically said he wasn't for sale and they told Portsmouth they were unsure whether they were going to loan him out so they brought in Cameron Pring from Bristol City and then a few weeks later Seddon was loaned out but that is the dilemma when you try to loan players do you wait to see if your number one target comes in or do you move on so Lee Brown's in back in at left back and, and done okay Christian Burgess is a real shame to go, a player who really, really threw himself wholeheartedly into the club, really popular, really had a fantastic spell at Portsmouth. He's not been directly replaced, but Jack Watmore coming back to full fitness is a really good replacement. Watmore is a fantastic centre-back. The only sad issue he has is he's had a succession of serious knee injuries and you always worry if that would happen again. So... In some ways, there have been replacements to those two. McGeehan is interesting because, no, there hasn't really mm. been a replacement brought in in central midfield. They tried to get Ben Thompson back in the window. It was always a bit of a long shot from Millwall. It didn't happen. So they do look a little bit short of numbers in those two central midfields role. Tom Naylor, the captain, is, is nailed on for his place. But who plays alongside him is a bit unclear. It had been Bryn Morris. He hadn't had much impact. Ben Close came in and then was dropped again. So... Yeah, McGeehan hasn't been replaced. And you do think Portsmouth could probably do with another midfielder. Kenny Jackett wanted McGeehan back, but the money he was offered in Belgium was far north of anything Portsmouth were going to be able to offer. It's kind of crazy that you end up with two players from the third tier that end up going overseas, a real, a real rarity. Um, is that the one knock against the transfer business in the summer then? Lack of depth in midfield? I think the other thing is the lack of depth up front. They took a little bit of a gamble by effectively playing with only two number nines. And then typically the first match after the window, Ellis Harrison picked up a muscle injury and is out for two to three weeks. And as we know, the way the fixture list is at the minute, two to three weeks out could mean seven games. So John Marquis is really the only recognised striker Portsmouth have. The challenge with the strikers, I don't think they had the budget or the ability to bring in a striker who's going to go straight into the team ahead of Harrison or Marquis. And it's then... You try and maybe bring in a young loanee to play as your third choice centre forward. Now, Championship and Premier League clubs are not as keen to loan someone out knowing that they're going to be third choice. They'd rather send all some to League Two and have them play every game. So midfield, definitely, they look short up front. If Marquis picked up an injury at some point in the next few weeks, you, you really wonder what they're going to do because they don't have anyone used to playing as a number nine, as a, a focal striker. Yeah, that's, that's a real problem for Sunderland. We've had it where... We had Kaziah Sterling on loan from Tottenham, never played him, and now the big clubs they, they go elsewhere. They don't they don't give us their best loan players. So it's a is a real dilemma. And those two are they're they're big names for the division as well. 
So it's it's yeah, it's it's you're not going to pull the wool over the eyes of these big clubs. And that's that's also been quite an interesting dynamic that is it Harrison, is it Marquis? Can you play them together? You you mentioned that Marquis got a much needed goal recently. How's how's he been getting on? He struggled at the start of this season. The thing is with Marquis is we know he's a good goal scorer, but the the formation that Jacket wants to persist with, which is a 4-2-3-1, that one role doesn't really suit him. He needs a bit more support. You could play Harrison and Marcus. They have the, the, the trappings of a good partnership, but Jacket doesn't seem to really want to do it. And while Marcus might have the, the more impressive goal record, actually, what Harrison brings to the team, he is a big, strong physical centre forward who's also mobile. He's good in the air. The centre halves really know they're in for a battle. And I sometimes think that's what you need as a lone striker. You need to be able to occupy the two centre-halves. And, and Jacket's formation, the goals are generally scored by the three who play behind the striker more than the striker themselves. So Harrison is more of a fit, but then Marquis has that impressive goal record and Portsmouth paid the best part of two million for him last summer. So you'd hope you'd be able to get a bit more out of him and he did get the goal he needed against Gillingham. But there's still question marks of, about you spent all that money on someone like John Marquis. Are Portsmouth getting the best out of him? The answer so far in his Pompey career is probably has to be no. Is there anyone else we haven't touched on yet that you'd flag up as a key player, somebody that we should keep our eyes on? I mentioned Michael Jacobs a bit and he, he didn't come in fully fit because he didn't have a full pre-season with Wigan. There have just been flashes of a player who's won the division three times and, and the quality he brings. If someone's going to unlock a defence for Portsmouth, it's most likely to be him. And if he gets fully fit, he says he's, he's getting there now, having spoken to Dafter Gillingham. He's really a, a really creative player. And what Portsmouth needs, someone to create chances for the likes of, of Marquis and, and Curtis if he's in the team. So he's certainly someone to, to watch out for. Is I, I kind of get the impression with the frustrations that the fans have been having with Jacket that there's not really anything Sunderland fans are going to be surprised by by Portsmouth. But is there any particular tactical wrinkles or anything that he might he might throw that that might be new based on the other sort of five or six games we've had in the last two years what's interesting is Kenny Jack has, has claimed at times you're playing two up front even though when you watch it it looks very much like you've got an, a main number nine and someone just off him in, in Marcus Harness now Harness got his first goal at the Stadium of Light last season feels a lifetime ago that mm. moment he, he's been inconsistent this season but the hat trick he scored against Burton he looked a brilliant player and we've always felt watching him that he's ready to kick on and, and be a player who can play higher than League One. He's someone to watch out for and whether he plays just off the striker. But with Kenny Jacket, I don't think you're going to see too many tactical curveballs, albeit he did experiment playing three at the back against South End in the EFL Trophy. But then again, South End having made six changes was, to be honest, nothing better than a National South outfit. They were mm. so poor. And he really went to that formation because that just suited the players that needed minutes more than it's something he, he's going to use. He, he's willing to try three at the back. He did it against the second half against MK Dons. It's never quite worked for him. I don't think you're going to expect hugely variable tactics or hugely variable formations. Kenny Jacket has had success doing what he does and he's someone who likes to keep doing that. Yeah, Harness like Curtis is a guy that, that, that sticks out in the memory just because he's always played well against Sunderland at this level. Even even in the Burton games, him and him and Boyce caused us problems and looked looked like a real problem at this level. Andy, I'll, I'll grab a score prediction off you to wrap things up. What do you reckon? I, I'm going to go for 1-1. And I think Portsmouth would, having won at Gillingham, would be pretty happy to, to go away from Stadium of Light with a, a point and then two home games coming up to try and build up and cement a, a place in the top six. I've, I've, I've got to go one nil. I, I always predict a Sunder win when I do this because in League One, I kind of feel I have to. But given, given the way Parkinson's got this team defending, given the way we've clamped down, and also, for the most part, the Portsmouth games, we've kind of, we've kind of done a good job restricting you. I mean, the, the Fratton Park game in February was a blowout. But the other games, I mean, the Leuven's red card at Fratton Park kind of set things in motion. But I kind of feel like defensively, we, we do okay against Portsmouth. So I'm going to bet that that trend continues and go 1-0 as well. It's funny because those games that were, must have been, what, three in about three months were, mm. were such strange games at the, at the end of the season. The playoff game, that Saturday night game that just felt so flat given what was at stake and, and the atmosphere we'd had a few weeks before. And then what was on the start of the... I remember the game last season when Portsmouth went 1-0 up and I remember the manager was under pressure 
And you just looked at Portsmouth and under jacket, you thought once they get leads, they look pretty good. And, and Sunderland turned it round to win 2-1. And that ultimately highlighted what was a problem at Portsmouth, that they just, to start last season, they were just not as defensively solid as, as they would like to be. But it, it, it's interesting how you say it, it feels similar to when Portsmouth played Gillingham. It's just who, who, who gets that first goal at the minute? Because it feels like teams have not hit their straps on an attacking wise. And whoever gets that, that first goal feels pretty confident and, and feels they can hold things out defensively. Yeah, I, f- I think at this point, it's, it's probably fair to say we've become great front runners under Phil Parkinson. But but that's the big challenge. I mean, in the Bristol Rovers game, you talk about pressure in an empty stadium. It was football at 110 miles an hour, switch balls going out of play, players losing their touch, everybody just being out of control. And and we're going to go behind first again in the game. And it's, it's how do we react to that? Because that's been a real problem for us really under Parkinson. That will be a key one. The other one that, that sticks out in my mind when it's Sunderland-Portsmouth was the 1-1, when our chances of going up were pretty much gone and Portsmouth was still very alive and well. And that was a game where I remember thinking their season was on the line and they struggled to create chances against us. And that was a big a big sort of confidence booster for me going into the playoffs. And that was kind of one that, that I flagged up as maybe we're we're as good at worst as this team. What surprised me about that game is with, with 20 minutes to go, it was 1-1. Had Portsmouth found a winner and won that game, automatic promotion was still in their own hands. And Portsmouth really settled for a point. Now, really, Portsmouth's automatic promotion chances were blown on the Tuesday night against Peterborough. And there's a, there's a famous moment where basically Portsmouth had a two-on-one at 2-2 and Brett Pittman squared the ball and Viv Solomon Otterbaugh had gone offside tapped it into the empty net, the flag went up, Peterborough went up the other end and scored and that was, that was it, game over. That's kind of viewed as the moment that the automatic promotion push ended. But it was strange that Saturday. I just remember that game, the 1-1, because the atmosphere at the start was electric. Mm. The first half, it came out a really good tempo. Sunderland took the lead, looked really good. Ports had got an equaliser. And then I just remember the game dying away and feeling so surprised that it had, given what in theory was at stake for both teams. Exactly the same at the other end, exactly the same. 20 minutes to go. We we had a lot of the ball in that final 20 minutes, but I was thinking, get centre-backs in the box, do some long throws, do something. If we lose this game, it doesn't matter. We're in the playoffs. Let's let's have a go. And it, yeah, like you said, just weirdly, weirdly flat. But fingers crossed, Saturday's game will be a better one. And thanks so much for your time, Andrew. All the best um, for the rest of the season. Well, provided you don't take one of those automatic promotion spots from us. Well, we'll see. At the moment, I would say it looks more like one of the four spots underneath than <laughs> one of the top two. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're right on that one. Thanks so much. Bye Brilliant. Now. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.